Okay? Yeah, now we're Oh. I'm going to have to cut it a little bit because I, I really am thankful to be here this morning. I, um, we were here from 2003 to 2016, and, and I, we are now at uh, Sovereign, Grace Bap- uh, Sovereign Grace Family Church in Ocean Way, where there are three pastors, of which I am one of them. And um, I also want to say I, I'm thankful that, that you're still here. And what I mean by that is that this, this church, and I know it's over a century old, and um, that the lighthouse is still going here. And, and so I am really thankful not only to be here myself, but the fact that you are here. And, and I also want to say I am thankful for Brother Kermit and for Brother Dempsey. Um, I know Brother Dempsey better than I know Brother Kermit, but I will say this. I have come to understand that both of them love the Lord, love the Word of God, love the people of God, and love the gospel. And so if that's not a cause to be thankful, I'm not sure what would be uh, a rightful cause. And it is good to see some of you that were here when I was here. Luke is extremely good to see. See you here this morning. Oh, by the way, I get emotional. And and I have a little bit of an accent. I am from the South, but it's from the South Bronx. And I read from the New King James. So So as you, uh, as we approach the word this morning, if you would, take your Bibles and Open up to the book of First Thessalonians, and we will read a portion of chapter 2 from verse 1 down through verse 12. However, the text really for the message this morning is verse 12. But let us read the Word of God together, and then let us ask God's blessing on that Word that He has given us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. As Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from deceit or uncleanness, nor was it in guile. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who tests our hearts. But neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, Just as a nursing mother cherishes her her own children, so affectionately longing for you, you we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. You remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk, would, that you would have a walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And let us again ask God's blessing on his inerrant, infallible, and glorious word. Our Father and God, again, we come to you in Jesus' name, Lord, and as we come to this portion of our worship, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and be the teacher. Lord, we are so frail, we are so unable in and of ourselves to to do anything, even as you have said to us, without you we can do nothing. And so we ask you to to come and to do what only you could do, and that's to take your word and make it real in our hearts, real in our lives, that it would transform us, that it would change us, that it would cause us to see you for who you really are, 
the Lord of glory. So again, Lord, come, be the teacher, and may we grow in the grace and the knowledge of the one who so loved us that he gave himself for us. Amen. So I want to begin by uh, saying that to kind of just make sure we understand the setting a little bit in a, in a real short way. And by the way, I was told I don't need to worry about the time. So you might fall asleep by the time I'm done. But, but I want to start with the context of, of the letter because I think it's important for us, and I hope you would agree, uh, th that to know who is being addressed and to know why uh, that letter is being written, as Paul writes many of the New Testament epistles, that we understand that somewhat the text and the setting. And this is, <clears throat> this is really one of Paul's earliest letters to the churches. And this is a church that Paul had uh, been used by God to raise up, and it's one of the, the newer churches in his ministry and, and I want to say this, again, before we get into the details of the text, that this church was a church that Paul deeply loved. And you can see it even if you look at it in verse 7 as he writes to them, and he says, we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. And then again in verse 8, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives, because you had become dear to us. Then again, in verse 11, as you know that we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. And so when you, when you, you look at 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians, we need to keep in mind how, how dear these people were to the Apostle Paul. And I, and I wanted to mention this because I... I do think at times, when it comes to 1 Thessalonians and even 2 Thessalonians, that uh, in 1 Thessalonians there's that, that passage that many people use to, to promote the rapture, and then in 2 Thessalonians, if you will, there's that passage about the, the man of sin and, and the falling away, and I do think at times we lose sight of the, of the intimacy and the and the desire of Paul towards the church in Thessalonica because those passages uh, seem to be the ones that everybody goes to. And yet, if you read through First and Second Thessalonians, you will find that this church truly was uh, close to the apostle's heart, as all the churches were that he was, by God, used to begin. And so, lest we miss the forest for the trees, if you will, as you read through First Thessalonians, bear that in mind, and do not allow some of the, the, the more prominent passages or those passages that people look to for, to build doctrines and, and, and teachings to cloud your, your thinking. So uh, I just wanted to at least get us to understand that. And that's about as far as I want to go with the setting right now, because otherwise it would take up too much time. So let me begin um, with a few remarks before we look directly at the text. So I wanted to say it this way. If I had to give a, uh, if I had to give a summary verse, if you will, of the Christian life, I would say that verse 12 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, would be very high on my uh, list and choice to explain what the Christian life is all about. So read it again with me. That you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And that would be a, a, a great way to summarize the essence or the reality of what it is to be a child of God, to be a Christian. I would also say that as you look at this verse, and as I hope and pray God will allow us to do it, as we, we look at this specific verse, we will see that it, it really is a, 
a verse that is pregnant, if you will, with, with much teaching and much practice. And I do think that we need to also to bear that in our mind, that the, uh, the way in which the New Testament is given to us, laid out for us, as I'm sure Brother Kerman and Brother Dempsey explained to us over and over again, is that in many of the epistles, the, the writer, particularly Paul, but also the other New Testament writers, they lay out in the beginning of their letters to the churches, whatever church it might be, they lay out doctrinal truths. They lay the foundational uh, beliefs and, and, and truths that come out of the, the reality of the gospel. And then if you read through these same epistles, as, you move, as they move through them, they then leave, in that sense, from the, from the doctrinal teaching to the practical application. And, and, and that's really what is given to us in this verse. And that's why I said to you that I believe as we look at this verse, we will see how pregnant it is with both doctrine and practice. And my friends, don't ever separate doctrine and practice. Because they are united forever. They are, that's the reality, isn't it? Of what it means to be a child of God. There is an understanding in our mind, there's a doctrinal teaching that we have been given by the Spirit of God. It's implanted in our hearts. We, we now have a, a worldview that is based upon God and not man. And then there is a, an outworking, a doctrinal application that must flow out of that understanding. And sometimes people will allow doctrine to become the thing and the only thing that they look at. And then there are others who will just go to application and they'll say things like, well, doctrine doesn't matter. We have t-shirts that we hand out in, our, in the church we're at now and it says, theology matters. Because theology matters. And so does practical living. And again, you cannot separate it. It is impossible to rightfully separate what we believe and how it affects us. And so I say to you that as we read this verse, there is both doctrine and there's practice, and my hope in, in a small way is to give us some doctrine and some practice and always remember again that it is something that can never be separated. Now, Again, before we look specifically at the text, and I promise you we will look at the text. But I also wanted to mention that as we read what he writes in verse 12, that you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory, that this is not something that was isolated to the church at Thessalonica, but rather these are words that Paul in other epistles towards other churches says in very similar ways, and I think that again is important for us to understand, so let me just mention one or two of them. In Ephesians chapter 4, you don't have to turn there, but in Ephesians chapter 4, in the very first verse, it says, I therefore, this is Paul, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And then, Again, in the book of Colossians, to the church at Colossae, he says this in the first, very first chapter, and in the 10th verse, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And if you would, keep that word that I have repeated now, both in 1 Thessalonians, and in Ephesians, and in Colossians, it's the word worthy. And that's really what I want to focus on this morning. Friends, brothers, sisters, we need to walk in a worthy manner. Amen. We need to walk in a worthy manner to the glory of God. 
And there are things that are associated with that and there are things that are essential to that. And, and, and I need to add this too. Whatever we can understand about a worthy walk, it is something that is not optional. It is not something that we do to gain extra credit before God. It is absolutely essential that if we are going to walk in the Lord, that we walk in a worthy manner. Now already I'm getting excited. And, and I will tell you, I will get excited. And, and if you want to know why I get excited, I'm going to tell you right now why I get excited. How could you not get excited about the Word of God? But I want you to bear in mind this word worthy and, and to think of it not as something that is only for the, the super Christian or the pastor or the deacons or, or sister so-and-so who has been in the Lord for uh, decades. Listen, my friends, a worthy walk is the only walk before our God. And so as we move through it, I ask you to think and consider as we go through some of the thoughts, where are you at? Where am I at in my walk before God? I could say it this way, that a worthy walk is the goal that we ought to have. A worthy walk is the goal that we ought to have. Have. It is the thing we ought to strive for. In Philippians, Paul says this way, says this, he says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And you want to know what it is? It's a worthy walk. It's living our life in a way that glorifies God. In Hebrews chapter 3, it says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Listen, if you and I have been made partakers of the heavenly calling, ought we not walk before this glorious God in a worthy manner? Is it not essential that we live in the light of that truth of what has been done for us and in us by the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me get started. One of the other brothers in the church, one of the other pastors, when he preaches, he'll go 25, 30 minutes and say, okay, now we got through the introduction, now we're going to get at it. But let's get at it. So, look at the verse with me. That you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Just take the first two words. That you. And I think it's, that's important, right? We need to know who's being addressed. Listen, when you study your Bible, and, and I know Brother Herman and Brother Dempsey will We'll, we'll teach this, but, but I'm going to say it too. When you study the Bible, when you read God's Word, always look for the context. Always try to understand who is being addressed. It'll, it'll, I assure you, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble <laughs> in understanding the Word of God. Context is always king, if you will. And so it's important for us. And so when he says that you, it's important to know who is being addressed. Who does Paul have in view? And I believe that he is talking to both the body of believers in the Thessalonica church and he's talking to the individuals that make up that body. Now you might say, well, isn't that the same? And, and yes and no. Because I do believe he's talking to them as a body of believers and what he's saying is that that body 
that church that was established in Thessalonica ought to be a church that demonstrates that they are walking worthy before the world. And we'll get into what worthy means shortly. But I also believe that he's addressing individual believers. That he's specifically charging, and that's what he does, right? Because unless I got it wrong, in verse 11, he, they charged every one of you as a father does his own children. <clears throat> and so he's addressing both the church as a whole and the individual members that make up that body of believers. Because isn't that the truth, that we are, as a body, united together by the same Spirit? Right? Christ is the, is the head, and we are what? The body. Christ is the cornerstone, and we are living stones built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But then there's also that individual reality that you and I, by the possession of the Spirit of God, and it is possession, isn't it? That the Spirit of God who abides in us, that it's, it's a very intimate walk. It's a very personal walk before our God. And yet it has both this individual reality and it has this corporate reality. And the two should not, again, be separated. This thought, i got to stick to my notes because otherwise I guarantee you I'll be thrown out of here. But this thought about the Lone Ranger Christian, this thought about I don't need to be with the people of God to be a Christian, here's a word for it, baloney. If you are a child of God, how could you not want to be with the people of God for whom Christ died? You cannot make that separation. You cannot make it biblically. You can say whatever you want. But saying things and being right about what you say are two different things. And so as we think about it, as Paul is addressing them, he says that you and that thought has to be, again, that there is both this individual reality and there's this corporate reality. Or, if you want to think of it this way, there's an internal reality and there's an external reality. Right? If any man be in Christ, what? He's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And, and how is that to be seen? Or how is it to be uh, manifested in our life? Whether it be in the life of a body of believers or in, the, in our own personal life. And certainly... The life that we live in public ought to be the life that we live in private. And that is difficult, is it not? And that's why, again, in Philippians, Paul says this, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. There's that word worthy again, by the way. And, and it has to be, again, internal and external. And so as Paul is addressing them, I hope we will begin to see that even just making uh, a, a few remarks about the first two words that we're already starting to see how big this verse really is. How, listen, my friends, the Word of God is living and powerful, isn't it? Amen. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces down into the very recesses of our soul. There is no place you can hide. We are naked before him. And so if we're going to be honest with the word of God, then we really need to, to plow up our hearts. I hope we begin to see that worthy walk before God is the only kind of walk there really is. And again, there are many who will uh, laugh at that. There are many who will dispute that. There are many who will say, oh, you Christians, that's all you do is read the Bible. That's all you do is, is think about the new heavens and the new earth. Well, brother, well, sister, I'll tell you what. 
this heavens and this earth is a mess. So why wouldn't I want to focus my life and my mind and my heart on the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwells righteousness, where there is no sin? Hmm. See, because that's really what we ought to desire, to dwell in a place where there's no sin. Because sin is the destroyer, isn't it? So he says to them, that you. He's addressing them. And then he says this, and, and, and want to just at least think about it. He says that you would have a walk. It's interesting, you know, if you read through the scriptures, how often we are charged to walk. At times we're charged to run, but really, what's running but quicker walking? (laughs) We are told that we are to be those who walk. And think about that for a minute. When you think about walk or walking, there's a couple of thoughts that come out of it. In other words, if you're going to walk, there has to be life, right? Isn't that one of the distinguishing characteristics of life? Is that there's movement, right? Isn't that what helps determine what is animate or inanimate? Is that there's, there's movement, there's life, there's energy, there's progression, there is a continuous movement. And that's really what Paul is talking about when he talks about this walk, that it is something, again, as I have tried to say, is a continuous movement action on our part. That we would walk worthy. That whatever we can glean from this verse and from the Word of God, that we would see that it has to be a continuous part or a continuous movement in our life. It's always disturbing to me When I hear people say, like, yeah, I got saved when I was 12, 16, 22. I'm not really living for the Lord, but, you know, I was saved. Baloney. If we are a true child of God, we will progress. We must. That's the... The point and the reality of regeneration is of God taking out that stony heart of ours, dead in sin, and putting within it a new heart, that there's now life within us. And if there's life, there's movement, and if there's movement, there's progression, and that you and I would understand that whatever we can think of as far as the Christian life, it has to be something that is not only part of us, but it flows out of us. Now, and this is truly, I think, the point I really wanted to make this morning. He says that you would have a walk worthy of God. That you would have a walk worthy of God. That word worthy, friends, is so essential. For those of you who just came, good to see you again, Drew. Family. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. That this word worthy, my friends, This word worthy is of such great importance. In other words, let's just say we understand to to this point now that that if we are uh, a true child of God, that we are to have movement and it has to be progressive and it has to be life and it has to be energy and it has to be growth. But this thought of that kind of a, a walk being a worthy walk is where we really need to focus. And that word worthy is a, 
Uh, and believe me, I, I'm not good with grammar. Um, I got a lot of tools that I can use. Thank God for the tools. But I'm not uh, good in grammar. But I do know that that word worthy is an adverb. So I remember that. I also remember what an adverb does. An adverb describes a verb, right? Just like an adjective describes a noun. And, and the verb here is walk. And so when it talks about a worthy walk, what it's saying is that whatever this walk is, it is to be done in a worthy manner. And that word is, um, basically means suitable, if you will. It, it really means it becomes, uh, becomes us to walk in a suitable, worthy, and if you would, God-glorifying matter. So in other words, it gives definition. Definition to our walk. I believe in Jesus. Now how do I live? How do I walk? How do I, how do I function? In a worthy manner. And we'll get to what that really means, but just again from this thought of worthy. It is, it is, it's interesting because it's the same root word, if you will, that's in Revelation chapter 4 where it says, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy to receive the honor and the glory and the power and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And it, isn't, it, isn't that true? Amen. Christ is the worthy one. Amen. Christ is the one who it becomes to, to honor and glorify and serve and submit. And alone, Christ is worthy. There is no one else more worthy than the Son of God. Amen. And so when you read that in Revelation, it is in that way the same root word in a different usage that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, and so that you and I can begin to understand what it means, in essence, to be a child of God. That we would have a walk that becomes us, that we would have a walk that is filled with honor and glory and service and praise and worship to the one who we call the great physician, to the one that we call the captain of our salvation, to the one that we call the apostle and high priest of our faith. And that, if you will, and I will show you in, in just a few minutes of how this view that we're given in the book of Revelation focuses in on that, how Christ alone is worthy, and not only is he, is he worthy in this world, but he's worthy in, in all the worlds that have ever been or ever shall be. That even the heavenly angels and the heavenly beings fall down because, again, he alone is the worthy one. This walk that Paul charges them has a very clear focus attached to it also, friends. Look at it. That you would have a walk worthy of God. Now you might say, well, that makes sense. But let me ask you to think about this. When he says that you would have a walk worthy of God, he's not just talking about someone or even something. He's not talking about a denomination. He's not talking about an organization. He's not talking about a movement. He's not talking about this, that, or the other thing. He's talking about the living God. That we would have a walk worthy of God. Listen. 
We breathe God's air. We eat God's food. I say this to everyone. We breathe God's air. We eat God's food. We behold God's majesty in the creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows forth his handiwork. And God is majestic. And God is the great designer. And God is the great artist. And God is the, cre the creator. And we are but creatures. Who else is worthy? None. That's right. That our walk, the way we live, the way we think, the way we react, the things that we will do, the things that we won't do, the things we will say, the things that we won't say, that it is brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's worthy of, of the glory of God. See, God is to be honored. Let, let me just put it to you this way. The God who is the true God is not some two-bit God of man's imagination. He's not a God of wood, nor a God of stone. He's the living God. He's the only true God. And he is worthy of a walk in conformity to him. You see, the, the higher we understand who God is, the worthier our walk will be. I'm convinced of that. I will, I will say this. I am convinced there are, there are many reasons why people will not submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I will say that two of the main reasons is either they don't believe that God sees them in their sin. And the second thing is even if they believe that to some degree, they don't believe God will do anything about it. My friends, I'm here to tell you this morning that God both sees the very thoughts and intents of our hearts and God will judge in that day. And every eye will see him. Even those that pierced him. And so is it not that we should have a walk worthy of God. That we should have a walk that will give glory to the one to whom glory is due. Because he's the true God. Because he's the living God. And that uh, this, this suitable way in which we live, it ought to be pleasing to him. Right? How many of us would say there was a time in our life when all we wanted to do was please ourselves? We were our own God and we were very happy with ourselves. And we enjoyed the pleasures of the sin that we, we allowed. But what happens in regeneration? We get a new heart. <laughs> we get a new mind. And all of a sudden now, the pleasures that we had in the sin are no longer pleasurable. Why? Because there's a greater pleasure that's been implanted, and that pleasure is to, to honor and worship God. I, I have a way of saying it, and I might get in trouble because some people might understand, God is cool. I mean that as reverently as I can. God is absolutely so cool. And he's so worthy of our walk. He's so worthy of us to bring every thought, to, to seek his kingdom. And that's part of walking worthy, is, is to seek his kingdom. Seek ye what? First, the kingdom of God. Not... not well, Lord, uh, you know, I give you Sunday morning, but, you know, I'm busy during the week. Or I, I give you, Lord, uh, I, I'm really spiritual. I give you Wednesday night. But, you know, I got a lot of other things going on. Listen. Listen. 
by the Spirit of God, we ought to be captive and captivated with Christ. And that's why I say some, so many people have such a small perception of God. Well, they have such a large perception of themselves. And we need to get a, a higher view of who God is. We need to get that view that Isaiah had, right? In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his, his throne filled the temple. That you and I would see that what Paul is charging them with, what Paul is exhorting them with, what Paul is stressing to them is that they would walk in a manner to the one and I just love to say this, who inhabits eternity. <laughs> who is God, by the way? God is the great other. At least that's the way Ossie Sproul said it. He said God was the great other. And he is, if you think about it. Who is like God? Who alone inhabits eternity? What does Paul say in 1 Timothy? He says, who alone dwells in the light that no man can approach? The only wise God. Listen, friends, the Muslims can say what they want, and Jehovah Witnesses, and the Mormons, and the, the Roman Catholics, and everybody else. And you know what? There is only one God. By definition, there is only one God. There is only one who is absolutely supreme. And we ought to bring our lives into subjection to him. And seek to walk before him in a worthy manner. I'll tell you what, uh, that ain't easy, is it? I've been at it for almost 50 years, and I'm a mess. There are so many holes in my life. There are so many things that are so wrong with me. And all I could do is say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich, so free. A walk worthy of God. Now, I want to go to a little bit on the doctrinal side. And, and I know how I'm supposed to preach. You're always supposed to preach doctrine first, application second. I've been struggling with that for years and years and years. I have a very tough time separating application from doctrine. And I pray that I will continue to have a very tough time separating Doctrine from practice. But, let's look at this for a minute. He says, let me just read the verse again, that you, we know who he's addressing, would have a walk, we know the activity, we know the focus, it's worthy of God. And then he says this, who calls you. Now, we need to pause there. Because I do think that we could do great damage to this verse if we don't understand what he means when he says that we would have a walk worthy of the calling of God. And here's, here's the point. There is several calls, if you will, within the gospel. There's the call which men have termed, and, and probably rightfully so, the general call of the gospel that goes out, right? Sure. Goes out to the ends of the earth. Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest unto your soul. Right? And, and again, even the invisible things of God, from the creation, 
demonstrate. And, and, and Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. And day unto day it utters speech and night unto night it shows knowledge. And there is no place, no language where that speech is not heard. And there is a call that goes out to all men. God commanded every man everywhere to what? Repent. And we should never undervalue that call. But my friends, thats I don't believe that's what he's talking about here. I believe he's talking about a very specific call. Or, as some might term it, an irresistible call. Or an effectual call. That this is the call that God, listen, God saves sinners. Now, is the, is the general call insincere on God's part? Absolutely not. God doesn't desire the death of the wicked, does he? God says, ho, oh, everyone that's thirsty, come to the waters and drink, and, and, and drink freely without price, without money. But my friends, there is a special call of the gospel that God, before the very foundation of the world, had predetermined. Oh, did I say predetermined? Are you going to talk about the sovereignty of God? You bet I am. I do not understand how people could be offended about the reality of the sovereignty of God. We, get, we can agree that, well, God is sovereign over the moon and the stars. Well, and God is even sovereign over raising up leaders and governments. But how many people will get all twisted up Wait a minute, you're not saying that God is sovereign over the affairs of life? Yes, he is. This is a special call. This is, we have been called by God. Effectually. And I will say this, friends. Praise God that he is, he is the one who intervened in my life. You glad that God intervened in your life? I know you are. That God, in his own mercy and grace and love, called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's right. That's right. And you know, there are so many who, there are so many who twist the truth of the doctrines of grace that we hold so dear. And I know you hold to the doctrines of grace, so uh, I would say even if you didn't, but it's much easier when I know you believe in the doctrines of grace. But there are so many who twist the doctrines of grace, and they'll say things like this. Well, it's unfair that God only saves some. My friends, it's absolutely amazing that God would save any. You know why men get all twisted up about the sovereignty of God? I believe one of the main reasons is they don't understand the depravity of man. If you understand that man is dead in sin, if you understand that a man can no longer change his spots than a leopard, or that the Ethiopian could change his own skin, if you and I believe that we have been, uh, that dying we died in Adam, man, once you can understand the deadness of men apart from the grace of God, then the sovereignty of God becomes an absolute blessing. That he would take a, a wretched creature like me, and for no other reason than that he loved me, that he saved me.
that he took me from what I was to what I am. And I ain't much. Or as Augustine would say it, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. It was by his grace, friends. And only by his grace. And so when you, when you begin to look at this and you begin to look at the calling, it's an effectual calling and praise God for it. And, and regardless of whether men will, will malign it or misuse it or misrepresent it, Paul is charging them because he knows that this church has been raised up by the grace of God. He doesn't take credit for it. Well, he was mightily used by God, but he wasn't the author of it, was he? No. How could he be? We in and of, in and of ourselves, friends, we deserve nothing. I hope we realize that this morning. We have nothing to offer God. And yet, and yet, it says that God has written our names on the palms of his hands. You know why he has his, our names on the palm of his hands? Because Christ allowed them to drive nails through his hands to make us the children of God, that we might have his righteousness. Because we ain't got any. What does the prophet say? All our righteousness is as filthy rags. Well, I don't know, man. You, you're making people sound awful terrible. We is. <laughs> I don't know what to say. We, we are terrible. God is great. And God takes us and takes out that ugliness and he puts in the beginnings of the beauties of Christ. And so when he says this, that you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you, that we would realize that we have been, we've been saved. You know, we use that term so flippantly. Are you saved? Oh yeah, aren't you? What does that really mean? I'll tell you what it means. We've been, we've been saved from the slave market of sin. We've been saved from the wrath of God, which one day shall be poured out upon every and all who rebel against him. I don't care what Joel Alstein says. I don't care that he doesn't want to talk about sin. The Bible talks about sin. Our lives demonstrate that there is sin. And praise God, the Bible talks about a Savior from sin. And he calls us, friends. He calls us. And, and I, I've yet to figure out why. Other, I know what it says. You know, one of my favorite hymns is by Isaac Watts. And one of the stanzas in it is, Why was I made to hear your voice and chose to enter in when thousands make a wretched choice and rather starve than come? You know, you and I know people like that, don't we? You and I know people... And we might even have them as sons and daughters and parents and husbands and wives and friends and neighbors and other people we work with. That although God pours out his goodness on them, and although God gives them air to breathe and food to eat and wives and children and all manner of blessings, and for all of that, they refuse to bend the knee. And don't ever look down on them, friends, because you and I were no different. Don't, let's, let's not get up high on our horse and say, well, I always have known God. No, you haven't. You might have thought you knew God. But until God, by his sovereign grace, 
stops us. And as I said, not only does he intervene, he interferes in our life. Oh, God wouldn't do that. Well, maybe your God wouldn't, but the God of the Bible does. He interferes in our life. Praise him, because if he didn't interfere, we would just crash into the rocks and go on to hell forever and ever. Let me read to you something from Revelation 5, and you don't have to turn there. And, and, it, and it's just, again, to highlight how God is so worthy of a, of a suitable walk, a daily walk, a moment-by-moment -moment walk, not this, this religious activity that so many people seem to, to hide under, but a true walk that, again, seeks to honor him in all that we do. In Revelation 5, we read this. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? No one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll to look at it. And so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came, and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when, the, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayer of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals. For you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. My friends, this is why Paul charges that church for a worthy walk. to forget the things that were behind and to press on towards the mark of the high calling of Christ. Because he's worthy! Yeah. We sang it in Christ alone. In Christ alone. It always amazes me, and in, in, in that sense, when, when I watch the people of God sing sometimes, because it's almost, to some, it almost seems like a bother. What? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Amazing grace! How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, <laughs> but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And listen, this is, this is where we all ought to be. Do not discount, you young people, listen for a moment. Do not think that God is obligated to give you a life that will go on for years and years and years and years and years. Praise God. And, and, and I pray that God will. But listen, you young people, walk worthy before God now. Don't let the world pour you into its mold. And you older kids, which you figure out, I, I'm not sure who's the oldest kid here. But some of you ain't Young chickens anymore. You know, what this, you know what it says in the Psalms, Psalm 92, I think it is? 
It says they will even bring forth fruit in their old age. There's a man bringing forth fruit in his old age. He could easily say, hey, you know what? I put my time in. It's time for me to kick back. And you know why he's not kicking back? Because he wants to walk worthy before God. Right, brother? That's right. And that ought to be our desire, friends. Glorify him. Lift him up. Exalt him. Be pleasing to him. Die unto self. Listen, man. You can't die unto yourself if you're only caring about your own self. <laughs> Walk worthy of God who calls you. And, and, and I, I know I got to move along. I know I'm not looking at my watch, but I am looking at my watch. Um, look what he says. He says, Walk worthy of God who calls you where? Into his kingdom. into his kingdom. My friends, do we realize what lies ahead for the child of God? We had a sister go home, I think it was last week, maybe, it was two, maybe two weeks ago. She was 92. She was, man, I'm telling you, she was no bigger than this. She said when she was in school, they called her sample size. Sample size. But you want to talk about a saint. You want to talk about someone who loved the Lord. And guess what? She went home last week and she's received her reward. We've been called not only in this life, but to eternal life. Forever and ever. Well, how long is forever? It's forever. When we've been there, what? 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's grace than when we first begun. You see, because his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. Because he's there. Right? And because there is no sin there. I don't know about you, but that's what keeps me up at night. Is my sin. And then once in a while I think about other people's sins. But the thing that really disturbs me is my own sin. Like you might say, well, I don't really have much sin. Whew. You sure you want to go down that road? Anyway, that we would have a walk worthy of God who calls us into his own kingdom and his own glory. So friends, I, as I begin to, to close down, I want to say, we ought to pursue holiness in the fear of the Lord. You know, that's not a well-received word today, is it? Holiness. The word that everybody wants is experience. I want to have a good experience. We ought to pursue peace with all men. And what? Experience? Happiness? No. Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So let me ask you, how's your walk going? I have to ask myself that. I think when, when I preach, I usually am preaching to myself. You just happen to be in my way. But how's, how's our walk going, folks? Are we pressing on in this most holy faith? Are we seeking to honor God? Are we seeking to really bring every thought into captivity? Are we really seeking to see him glorified, honored, praised, worship? Are we moving in that direction? You know what? Uh, uh, <laughs> there's no time out in the Christian life. <laughs> Just like in war, there's no time out. Really. I mean, they might have a ceasefire, but, but you, get, you get my drift, right? If you're in the middle of a battle, you can't just say to the enemy, time out! This, this, 
new heart that we've been given sovereignly by God, it must make itself manifest more and more in our life. As I close, let me address something to you if you don't know the Lord. Oh, brother, you, you're here at Oak Grove. I mean, you were here. You know, everybody knows the Lord. No, I don't. And you don't know if I know the Lord. Now, you might see evidence. Listen, if you think every preacher who comes in and preaches a message is bound for heaven, you're mistaken. There are many people that can preach the word of God that will wind up in eternal punishment because they really don't love the Lord. So I will address everyone here this morning. And maybe you know about God. There's a lot of people know a lot about God, right? Especially if you've brought up in a Christian home. I mean, who doesn't know about Jesus? But I'm not asking you if you know about Jesus. I'm asking you if you know Jesus. I'm asking you if you know in the depth of your soul that you were lost and now you found that you were blind and now you see. That he has done a work of redemption in your life. As I said, you're not what you want to be and you're not what you ought to be. Praise God, you're not what you used to be. Well, I used to be really good anyway. No, you weren't. There's none good. No, not one. Right? You might have looked good, you might have smelt good, you might have even talked good, but listen, there is only one that's good, and that's God. And there's only one Savior, and it's Jesus. And so, I exhort you, I encourage you, I, I, I say this to you in this way, and I mean it from, from all that I can say in sincerity. If you don't know Christ, run to him. Don't walk. Run. You remember the teaching of Jesus? He said that there was coming a time when the master was going to shut the door. And he says, then there'll be people and they'll be standing outside. And they'll be knocking on the door. Lord, Lord, let us in. You remember what he said? No. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. If you don't know Christ, run to him. I always get a, a, a charge when people look at Revelation, I think it's Revelation 3.20, isn't it right? Where he says, I stand at the door and I knock. And, and people think of Jesus as some shoe salesman who just can't wait, begging you to open the door so he can sell you some goods. That is not the Lord Jesus Christ. He's standing at the door. And he's knocking as the king of kings and a lord of lords. And he's saying to you, you must bow before me. And you will find rest to your soul. Because one day, someday, either he will come to you or you will go to him. And so may God grant us grace. Effectual grace, irresistible grace, grace with mercy to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. My friends, God bless you. God bless this church. And may we all grow in the grace and the knowledge again of the one who so loved us that he gave himself for us.